for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. All right, looks like we are live, guys. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, we were just having some buffering issues, um, but they look like they're clearing up a little bit. We've got uh, an exciting show for everybody tonight. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Matthew McLean, who's uh, going to be here to give us a presentation on the mammal-like reptiles. I am pumped for this. Uh, Dr. McLean, thank you so much for, for giving us your time for this incredibly important topic. Yeah, glad to be here. Thank you. Um, no problem. Awesome. I'm excited. Pull up my... In here. We do have some questions for Dr. McLean immediately following the presentation, but please tag me with your questions. If you have questions of your own, we are going to have a Q&A after uh, Dr. McLean's presentation. Now, before we get into the presentation, I give our guest here today just a brief introduction. And uh, this introduction can also be found in the description box of the video with the, with the, um, relevant links and, and information where you can find more about Dr. McLean. Uh, Dr. Matthew McLean attended Cedarville University where he received his BS in geology. He then moved to California to pursue his PhD in earth sciences from Loma Linda University. He is a member of the Geological Society of America and the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. His research interests include vertebrate paleontology, specifically projects involving dinosaurs and pterosaurs. And he has authored and co-authored several publications in peer-reviewed journals. He and his wife, Jessica, have four children, Alaric, Cody, Iris, and Soren. I hope I, I pronounced those right, uh, Dr. Did. McLean. Uh, enough for me. Perfect, <laughs> perfect, perfect. Uh, I've also got my amazing co-host here, uh, Ramat and Guzman. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. I know you guys are just as excited as I am. So thank you for being here, guys. Thanks, man. Thanks for having us. No problem. No problem. And thanks for yeah, having Enough for me. No problem, Guzman. My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, so it, enough from us. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. McLean. Of course, correct me on, on anything that I said there, if necessary, if you wanted to elaborate on anything. Uh, but once again, thanks so much for uh, being generous with your time and, and giving us your time today. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I don't have anything to correct. So if you were hoping, <laughs> okay, you know, perfect. Not gonna happen. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, um, we can go ahead and show the screen um, and begin the presentation if we're cool with that. There we go. Good deal. Um, so um, we are going to be talking about a creationist view of synapsids. Now, I know you see mammal-like reptiles up in the title there. Um, that's what they're sometimes known in the vernacular, common vernacular, but um, I, I don't like that term. So we'll, I'll explain why. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, we're going to, uh, to kind of move forward on this. So I want to start by presenting you with why this is an issue for um, – you know, the creation evolution debate. Um, me personally, I'm excited about these animals. Like I, I would study them regardless whether it's a debate or not. But, um, you know, one of the things that uh, is discussed in, you know, the evolutionary um, opinion of the fossil record and the way things are viewed is this transition from reptile-like animals to mammals. Um, and these animals, the non-mammalian synapsids, play that um, role, as we'll see in a little bit. Um, and so, for instance, you can see this is a book uh, written by 
um, James Downard um, called Evolution Slam Dunk, Why the Reptile Mammal Transition Proves Macroevolution and How Anti-Evolutionists Ignore It. Um, and this is actually from the back cover. Um, he says, reptile mammal transition is the most compelling case for macroevolution. Besides the fossils covering millions of years, there's a wealth of corroborating science data from developmental biology to the latest genetics. Now, how do those skeptical of evolution, whether they call themselves creationists or favor intelligent design, deal with all that evidence? They don't. And I would pretty much concur with um, James Downard in the sense that yeah, most creationists have completely ignored this issue. It's not something that you see really discussed. You'll hear creationists talk about um, dinosaurs and birds. You'll hear them talk about whales or some of those other transitional series. But um, this one just kind of gets bypassed a lot of times. Um, now, in their defense, um, also, it sadly doesn't get a lot of attention even in the evolutionary popular literature. Um, you know, you, it's hard to find books on this topic. Um, a lot of the really good books on it came out in like the 80s. Um, and so it's in need of, you know, good um, revision and, you know, summary and stuff for popular audiences. Um, a lot of the stuff is in the technical literature, which I think is, you know, why it doesn't get discussed very much on either side in the popular domain. Um, it's a shame, though, because these are interesting animals, as we're going to see. And um, I want to introduce you to them and to, to kind of see what we're looking at overall. So, um there's a few terms we're going to be using. So pelicosaurs, um, like Dimetrodon up here. Um, we'll look at him in a minute. Um, and then you're moving into a therapsid group, um, which is all these animals down here. Um, and therapsida contains the cynodonts. Um, and cynodonts, um, a uh, group within there is the Meliaformes, which is going to include uh, mammals. Um, and so you can see some true mammals down here, like this possum and um, platypus and Yanoconodon. Um, and what we're going to be seeing through this are trends in the posture and in the jaw. Um, and so before we can look at these animals with any kind of detail at all, um, we need to first ask, what is it that makes a mammal a mammal? What's special about mammals? What, what are their traits? Um, so, you know, pop a mammal up here, a nice duck bill platypus, pretty creature. Um, you know, you know about mammals having hair, um, producing milk, uh, giving birth to live young, just don't tell this one in particular. Um, but there's actually a lot of other features that you may not recognize are unique to mammals. Um, erect posture. Now, there are other animals that have erect posture, like um, dinosaurs, um, you know, you know, birds, um, some extinct, random extinct animals, a type of pariasaur and some other things. Um, but, you know, it is something that we see in our mammals, in most of our mammals. Um, a flexible lumbar region in the spine. The lower jaw is a single bone, and there are intricate inner ear bones. And I'm going to show you each one of these um, examples of these and, you know, um, how they're different from other animals. So, for instance, erect posture, um, whether you're looking at a thylacine, um, which is an, the extinct Tasmanian tiger, um, or a mammoth, or living mammals, um, if you can call this a um, mammal, um, these all have erect posture, you can see. Uh, where the legs are held directly beneath the body. And this is indicative of the active lifestyle these animals have. Um, I have a bearded dragon as a pet at home, um, and he does not have his legs directly beneath his body. They're sprawled out to the side. Um, and so that's part of um, part of the reason. There's several reasons, but part of the reason why he doesn't, you know, isn't able to keep up, you know, an endurance running kind of thing. He'll sprint for a little bit and then stop. Um, and, you know, it's it works for him. True lumbar region is the next thing I want to talk about. Here's a, a replica of a fossil um, amphibian-like animal called Seymouria. And um, you can see the vertebral column here, and there's ribs coming off of all the vertebrae there, um, all the way down to the hips. Um, you can see a similar thing in these dinosaurs. These are the dinosaurs back here, not the children. Um, and you can see uh, some therizinosaurs here where the, the ribs go all the way down to the hips again. But in mammals like this, um, Nim rabbit, if I remember correctly, but it's it's some kind of carnivorous mammal. Um, you can see the rib cage only goes to about halfway down, and the vertebrae back here um, are allowing for flexibility. What we call one you of know, the technical terms dorsal ventral flexion, so they can um, bend their bodies a little bit like an accordion. Um, and our reptiles and amphibians stuff, they don't do that. They bend their bodies side to side. So when you watch, um, you know, like a fish or a shark or a crocodile swim, they move like this side to side, right? 
Um, but when you watch a whale or a manatee swim, they swim like this, um, and they have that dorsoventral flexion going on. Mammals have a one bone lower jaw. So um, here we have a, a wolf skull, and there's the thylacine again, the Tasmanian uh, wolf, it's a marsupial, and they both have their lower jaws a single bone. You may not think that's very special, but when you look at a lot of other um, vertebrate animals, what you're going to see is that they have multiple bones. So you can see there's a dentary right here. Um, there's like a serangular, angular, articular, all kinds of bones in there. You can see them illustrated here on this, this diagram of a, um, a theropod dinosaur skull, um, which is different from this diagrammatic human skull. Um, we'll notice, like I said, the lower jaw is one bone. Here, the lower jaw is lots of different bones. And then we have those intricate inner ear bones. They're really cool. Um, there are these really interesting tiny bones, right? This is a penny, um, not sure what country, but um, you can see the different little bones there, um, the incus and the malleus and the um, stapes, and uh, also called like the, the hammer or the anvil and the stirrup. Um, and they, you know, will attach to each other like that and they're connected to the eardrum. And so as um, sound waves are coming in here and they bounce on the eardrum, you know, you've got this um, delicate movement that's happening with these bones, which are putting pressure on the inner ear cavity, you know, and uh, that's how we're able to hear. Uh, obviously, it connects to the brain and stuff after that. Um, these bones are really cool because they're these very intricate little shapes. Um, and they're actually, um, I could be wrong about that. I'm not a human anatomy person, but I've been told these are the only bones in your body that don't grow um, once you're born. They actually stay the same size. Um, and so they're very curious little things, and you don't find them in other animals. You find the stapes, one of the bones is found in reptiles and, you know, things like that, but you don't find those other bones in the ear. You don't have this complicated little apparatus there. So what I want to do now, now that we've seen what mammals are like, let's look at some of the animals that we see in the fossil record. Um, and we're going to look at pelicosaurs, which are a Permian group, Carboniferous Permian group, um, and they're very reptile-like in a lot of ways, um, but they are uh, synapsids. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, and you can see the sprawling posture on this KC it here is Cotillorhynchus. Um, you can see that you've got ribs going all the way down there. This thing's got a big barrel chest. This is a hilarious animal, by the way. Um, this is its skull. Okay. And lower jaw right there. Uh, <laughs> just this enormous body with this tiny, tiny head on it. Um, a little comical kind of thing. And they're big. Um, it's Cotillorhynchus compared to a person. It's a, it's a very large animal. Um, but, uh, you know, the more famous um, Pelicosaur, everybody, um, if anyone knows any of these, it's, it's Dimetrodon, right? This is the one that shows up in like little bags of dinosaur toys, like you get at the Dollar Tree and stuff. Um, it's got the big sail on its back, right? Um, it's carnivorous and they get pretty big too. We're talking like 12, 15 feet long. Um, but, uh, you know, this is not a dinosaur, even though it shows up in the little bags, you know, the Dollar Tree is not the authority on what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur. Um, you'll notice when you look at the skull of Dimetrodon, you can see um, this opening called the naris here. This is where um, the nostril, it's a correlate, bony correlate for the nostril. Um, this eye opening here, that's the orbit. Um, and then this hole back here, this is called a temporal fenestre, uh, fenestra, um, plural is temporal fenestre. And they have one. Well, dinosaurs are um, diapsids, meaning they have two holes back there. They have a lower one and an upper one. Um, but Dimetrodon just has the one here, you know, one on each side. Um, and that's the condition you see in the synapsids, whether it's dimetrodon or um, some therapsids we'll see in a little bit, or even mammals um, have this condition. Um, and there's Cicodontosaurus, just showing you, um, you know, what one of these uh, Spinacodont-like um, pelicosaurs or pelicosaurs are like. Um, so they're interesting animals. You know, they do have some similarities with us. I already talked about that, that hole back there. But, you know, other than that, they're pretty... Um, not mammal-like. You don't look at that and think, oh, that's a cuddly mammal, you know. Um, you probably think it's some kind of reptile-like creature. So when we look at the line going from pelicosaurs to mammals um, in the evolutionary story, um, you're starting with something like Dimetrodon, and um, you move into the therapsids, and you get to mammals. So, so what is in between? Um, well, a lot of really, really interesting things. You have Biarmasuchians, Dinocephalians, Anomodonts, Gorgonopsians, uh, Theracephalians, and your Cynodonts. So there's six main types of therapsids. Um, 
I wish we could just talk about these all the time. They're fantastic. They're amazing creatures. Dinosaurs get all the credit, and it's unfortunate because these are really fascinating um, things that got made. Um, and they're they're just spectacular, all kinds of very interesting creatures. I'll just give you a little snapshot just because I can't help myself. Uh, I want to show you the wild and wonderful world of Therapsids by starting with your friend and mine, Moss Chops. Some people say Moss Chops. I just, I feel like it has to be Moss Chops. I don't care what the pronunciation should be. I just want it to be Moss Chops. This is a really interesting animal. Um, it's built with like this big chest and these really robust limbs. And it's it's got this giant chest that so walks around kind of like a bodybuilder uh, moving around on four legs. Um, but its head is pachyostotic. The bone in there is very, very thick um, and just tons of bone. And the idea is that these animals would have been ramming their heads together, or at least pushing on each other. Um, and the uh, they've done some really cool work, um, some different scientists with um, doing CT scans of the bones and looking inside them and realizing that you can figure out how their heads were held. Um, their brains are kind of like at an unusual angle. And so it's telling us that they held, held their heads kind of down um, normally. And so, um, that works well for if they're going to end up butting into each other. Um, and it fits kind of the position of their eyes as well, but they're really interesting. They're in the group dinocephalia, meaning terrible heads. Um, there you go. Um, show you a dicynodont, um, which is in the group Anomodontia. Uh, these ones are, are also really interesting. They're also herbivores like moss chops. Um, but they have a beak like a bird or a turtle. Um, and then they have tusks, that go with it. So like basically imagine a pig, but put a beak on it. And that's kind of like a decinodon. Um, and Canamyra, this is a, this is a big genus. Um, you could ride this thing if you want to. Same with moss chops. They're, they're decently sized animals. Um, but not all of our therapsids were herbivores. Um, we also had carnivorous ones. So uh, you can see right here, Lycanops is a Gorgonopsian. Um, this is, uh, imagine kind of like if you mixed a reptile and a wolf is kind of what it feels like. Um, they have these big saber teeth um, on the upper jaw and the lower jaw, um, and they're clearly predators. Um, and they're, they're, they're really interesting animals. We'll talk about them a little bit more in a minute, um, but we just have to talk about my favorite synapsid, um, which is also my favorite animal of all time, and that's a Steminosuchus. Um, this thing is just wild. It's so fascinating. And specifically a Steminosuchus mirabilis is the, the more interesting species, I think. Um, you know, you look at this creature and you're like, no, no, there's no way, right? That it looks like that. Well, here's its skull. So yeah, it, it basically looked like that. Um, and it's got these really interesting, like antler looking bony appendages there. It's got these kind of flaring, um, bony processes off the side. Um, it's also got a horn on its nose, so like bump at least. Um, you can see, by the way, this thing called the pineal eye or the parietal eye. It's an opening on the top of the skull. Um, this is found in many, many groups of animals. My bearded dragon has one. I do not, um, but, but the bearded dragon does. Um, this thing looks fearsome. Uh, it was an herbivore. Now, for the record, herbivores can be fearsome. Like you don't want to mess with a hippo, right? Um, this was a big animal. Once again, you could ride this. I mean, it'd probably fight you, but you could try to ride it. Um, it's a it's a good sized animal, but I just, I look at this and I think, wow, um, how creative, how how incredibly interesting this this creature would have been to see in life, and um, that's one of the exciting things about paleontology is you know I get to see the glory of God expressed in things that I don't normally get to see, right, and then I get to express that glory um, of God to other people, and I, I find that really really rewarding and exciting. Okay, but interesting as it is, and much as I'd love to talk about that more, we we gotta get back to our topic, right? Um, what about becoming mammal-like? Do these things become more mammal-like as you make your way closer to mammals? Um, and so just some, some highlights right here. Um, the therapsid skull, so moving from pelicosaurus to therapsids, it is more mammal-like. I'll show you that. Their toes and fingers um, are more mammal-like, and we don't have time to get into that. It's a fascinating topic, but we're going to um, have to skip that for now. And their posture overall gets more mammal-like. They they start having less of a sprawling posture and you see more of kind of like a semi-erect and then some of them even erect or nearly erect posture. So I'll show you again the Gorgonopsians. Remember these are the ones I said are kind of like a reptile and a wolf uh, mixed together. Um, you can see the body of this thing, really interesting animal. Um, Gorgonopsians have a much more mammal-like skull. You'll notice that the, um, the temporal fenestra here is bigger um, and the uh, look at this thing. Yeah, it's like kind of reminds me of 
some kind of thing that I could see running around today um, in a lot of ways, um, but still also very unique. Um, and they can switch between a semi-sprawling and a more erect posture. Um, and depending on who you talk to, there's debates about whether that's true just for the forelimbs um, or the hind limbs. But, um, you know, some Gorgonopsian workers have said it's true for both. Um, and so the idea would be that when this animal is kind of just, you know, plodding along, doing its thing, it's got more of a sprawling posture. But when it is, you know, on the prowl, when it's attacking something, it's going to switch the more erect posture to allow it to run better. Um, and you can see something kind of like this in crocodiles, um, that crocodiles can do uh, more, you know, really, really sprawling, can switch to what's called the high walk. Um, and you'll see this like in videos when they go across golf courses and people are like, look at the giant alligator. It's all perspective things. Um, but they do something kind of like that, um, although they're more um, on their rec side overall than a, than a crocodile would be. But we move from our therapsids to one particular group of therapsids called the cynodonts. And cynodonts are really, really interesting. They tend to be on this much smaller side than uh, most of our other therapsids we've been looking at. You're not going to ride them. If you try, you're going to squish them. Um, but cynodonts are the most mammal-like of all of our non-mammalian synapsids. Um, so to say that is to distinguish all these animals from the mammals, which are also synapsids. Um, and so when you uh, look at them, for instance, one thing you'll notice immediately, look at this lower jaw almost the entire lower jaw is one bone. You see that? This dentary bone. There are some other bones back here, but they're squished way in the back. Um, that's not what we saw like in dinosaurs and stuff where you had a lot more of the jaw taken up by those other bones. Um, the other thing you notice with this particular genus, it's the Permian one called Procynosuchus. When you look at the palate of this animal, you can see um, what appears to be kind of like a, a proto-secondary palate. Um, it looks like the bones of um, kind of the, the margins around there and the palatine bones are, are coming together to fuse together to make a palate, but it's not quite there. Um, so that's interesting, right? Like what's going on here? And when you look at um, this animal, a Triassic cynodon called Thrinaxodon, um, the skull is even more mammal-like. Even more of the lower jaw is the dentary. They have true lumbar vertebrae. They have much more erect posture um, and they have a more complete secondary palate. Um, they've got other features too, a sagittal crest, a more mammalian zygomatic arch. Um, this is really cool. Let's see if I can get this to, to play for you. Um, oh, no, I cannot. <laughs> well, that's disappointing. Imagine with me for a moment <laughs> inside this nodule, okay? They found this rock, they did a CT scan of it, and inside of it is a thrinaxodon, this animal, and an amphibian called Brumistega um, in the same burrow really strange. Um, I wish I could show it to you. Maybe I'll show it to you at the end of the presentation. I'll try and find an image of it. Uh, for some reason, the animation isn't working, but um, really, really cool thing. Okay, now we get to another side of called Probanonathus. Um, and Probanonathus is, is interesting. Um, you look at, once again, look at the lower jaw. Now, I mean, the, it's basically one bone, right? There are these other tiny little bones, but they're, they're crammed way back here. Um, the jaw is overwhelmingly one bone, which is the dentary. Um, additionally, Probatonavis has something really interesting going on. It's got what's called a double jaw joint. Um, so when you look at Probatonavis, um, you can see something very peculiar happening here. And so we haven't talked about the jaw joint yet, so this is a good opportunity to do it. Um, if you look at a reptile, like the bearded dragon I was talking about, or even a dinosaur, um, the jaw joint you see in these animals, along with amphibians and birds, is between a bone in the um, skull called the quadrate and a bone in the lower jaw called the articular. And that's the jaw joint. But when you look at a mammal, mammals have jaw joints between the dentary, right, the big blue bone here, and a bone on the skull called the squamosal, okay? And so the question becomes, well, how do you have this transition between a, um, an articular quadrate jaw joint and a dentary squamosal quad jaw joint? Um, and this animal is fascinatingly, seemingly, looks like it has both jaw joints. Um, and it's unclear exactly functionally what's going on here, but um, the squamosal and the, the dentary might have been able to touch, but definitely the quadrant and the articular could. Um, and so you can see why an evolutionist would look at this and say, hey, this is a transitional form, right? <laughs> this is moving from one type of jaw joint to another. Um, and, you know, that's why they would claim that. And moving from our non-mammalian cynodonts into our essentially mammal animals, um, what we'll call our mammalia forms, um, 
They still can sometimes have somewhat sprawling posture, but they're, they're nearly erect. And even platypus and echidnas today have a sprawling kind of posture. Um, they do have fur. We know this from some fossils, um, like this uh, Spinalestes here, um, where you can actually see the fur preserved on the fossil. Um, they probably produce milk. Uh, we guess that because of um, one of these mammalian forms named Morganucodon. Um, it has tooth replacement patterns that suggest that they're, um, you know, taking in milk, basically, that the milk tooth thing kind of going on. Um, and so when you look at these animals and check out their jaws, you learn something really interesting. So um, this was a really cool fossil found in China, described in 2007, called Yanoconodon. You can see how tiny it is compared to that penny. It's a little tiny animal. Um, and here are some jaws. Okay, so I'll put the names up here so you can see them. Um, we've got a, a Morganucodon, um, a Yanoconodon, Repenomammus, and the platypus. Okay, um, and when you look at a Morganucodon, the lower jaw is all one bone, except for these tiny little bones in the inside and back of the lower jaw. And um, they have this kind of um, framing about them, like they're going around something. Well, that's uh, thought to be the tympanic membrane um, for hearing. Um, it's related to that. And when you look at um, Yanoconodon, you can see that they're really wrapped around there. Um, and the story is that these bones, those lower jaw bones, migrate further in and become the ear bones of mammals, the special little three ear bones we talked about, although one of them already be there. Um, so they become two of them. And, um, and then the ectotympanic too, which is um, what a deal. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. Okay, so this is the ear structure, ear bone structure of a platypus. Okay, and you can see how similar this is to the condition in Yanoconodon. What's distinct in a platypus, they're free floating, but in Yanoconodon, they're connected to the jaw by something called Meckel's cartilage. Now, Meckel's cartilage is a structure that's typically in, in animal mammals today and stuff, it's embryonic, it disappears as, as it develops. Um, but Yanoconodon and Morganucodon, even Repenomammus, show this structure as an ossified, you know, picane bone basically in the lower jaw. Um, and so that's interesting alone, but check this out. When we look at a, um, looking down on the jaw now, kind of like a dorsal view on it, um, you can see right here, two jaws and ear bone down there. This jaw is from Yonoconodon. This one is from an embryonic platypus. And then this is an adult platypus's ear bones. Okay. So when you look at Yonoconodon, it appears to be from the fossil that these bones are like peeling away from the lower jaw toward the inside of, you know, the head basically. Um, and they're only attached by this ossified Meckel's cartilage. Well, when you look at an embryonic platypus, a platypus that's developing as an embryo, what you can see is that the ear bones are attached to the lower jaw by Meckel's cartilage. And in fact, um, this has been known for a long time that um, the ear bones in mammals um, develop from the same stuff as the lower jaw during um you know embryonic development this was known um back in the 1800s even before therapsids were really discussed and understood as um relatives of mammals um and so this is something that is just known from development but you'll notice how incredibly similar these two things are and so you can see once again why an evolutionist would look at this and say the ear bones in mammals developed from lower jaw bones in these therapsids these non-mammalian therapsids um, and what sounded like a really silly idea at first, oh, that ear bones come from the lower jaw, that's absurd. Well, you look at it again, you're like, well, actually, that's not as absurd as I first thought, that I can see why someone would make that jump. And so when we look at the big picture for our cynodonts, this comes from a uh, Ruda et al. Uh, 20, what, 2013 paper? 2013 paper. Um, and you can see that there, um, we got the Permian back here and the Triassic and then the Jurassic, uh, making our way up the geologic column. Um, our, our Permian cynodonts have much smaller, uh, much smaller portion of the jaw as represented by the dentary, um, and you don't have a true secondary palate. But as you go to the Triassic, you have more of the lower jaw represented by the dentary. You have a true secondary palate. Um, you've got a good zygomatic arch, like you see in mammals. Um, you would prevent an aphis. You have that double jaw joint. Um, you keep moving through here. It looks like you're getting more and more mammal-like. And so not only is there a, a morphological sequence, okay, a shape sequence where you can connect animal to animal to animal to make a, um, what you would hypothesize to be transitional forms, 
But notice that the, the forms here that look transitional also match up with the rock layers. There's a stratigraphic pattern here. The ones that are less mammal-like are in lower layers, and the ones that are in that are more mammal-like are in more recent layers. Okay, so the older it is, the less mammal-like it is, the more recent it is, the more mammal-like it is. So when you look at all these things together, you gotta ask yourself, now what? Right? Because I can look at that and say that kind of looks like what an evolutionist would predict for the fossil record. And that's exactly the claim that Downer and many other people have made is, hey, this is what, um, this is, you know, it's been called the crown jewel of evolution. It's supposed to be the single best example in the fossil record of one vertebrate class becoming another one, um, reptiles like animals moving into mammals. So what do we do as creationists about this? But one option is we could just deny it. No, it's not the case, right? We could say, um, hey, maybe the fossils aren't real. Maybe they're all fake. Or maybe they weren't real animals. Just fossils are just things God planted in the ground or Satan planted in the ground or whoever. Um, but here's the deal. There's thousands of therapsid fossils out there. One genus in particular, Lystrosaurus, is just all over the place in the Triassic of South Africa um, to the point that um, some workers won't even pick up Lystrosaurus skulls because there's just too many of them. And plus, check this out, okay? Here are some footprints. Um, these are little tiny footprints from Tritilodont cynodonts in Nevada, of all places. Um, look at these guys. There's tons of them, tons of little guys running around on there, right? Um, so if you want to believe that the bones represent animals that never existed, you also have to believe that nothing made these footprints. <laughs> That's a really weird idea, right? Could you imagine, like, walking along the beach or, you know, seeing a dead animal and being like, that's not real. I don't think that's real. I think it just popped up one day. No, I mean, that'd be crazy talk, right? So I think we can, we can pretty confidently just throw out that idea. So what else could we do? Well, we could hide, right? Like this husky. Um, just say, well, I know it looks like evolution, but it just can't be. And then just pretend it's not there, right? Or build a shield around yourself so you, you don't hear about it, right? Plug your ears. Or you could try and ridicule the evolutionists and just make the whole thing look silly. Well, what's wrong with that? If all we do is hide, then the problem never actually gets addressed and we have no better answers, right? If we just try to make the other side look really silly and not talk about this, then when our children or grandchildren go off to a secular school and they hear about this stuff and it makes sense to them, they're not gonna know what to think, right? And maybe they'll think, huh, well, it's kind of makes sense. So it's probably true. And they'll think, well, why did my parents and Sunday school teachers and pastors lie to me and tell me that evolution's silly when it makes sense? And I think that's a dangerous thing that we're not preparing them correctly. So I don't think hiding is the solution either. So what could we do? What should we do? We should trust God. Listen to me, we don't have to know everything in science to be a faithful Christian. When Job asks why God was allowing him to suffer so much, God never told him why. He shows up in the whirlwind and, and he gives this long speech of all these interesting things in nature and how God knows them and Job and his friends don't. But he never actually answers Job's question of why am I going through this? And the reason God doesn't do that is because that's not what Job needed to hear. What Job needed to hear was exactly what God gave him. He needed to hear that God's in control, that God is sovereign that God is just, that God is loving, he didn't have to know about why his specific scenario was happening to him. And listen to me, you don't have to know what to do with the anaconodon for your life to be fruitful for the kingdom of God. <laughs> you don't, right? Um, you know what you need? You need to know that God loved you so much that he sent his only son to die in your place, to take on your sins and the punishment that your sins deserved, and to raise from the dead, showing his power for eternal life, for all who believe and repent. That's what you need to hear. So listen to me, that's our starting place. We depend on scripture, that's our foundation. And scripture is clear about the origins of animals and people. And that clear representation there in scripture does not include us evolving from cynodonts. Okay, so what do we do as a result then? Well, number one, we need to be honest. If you don't know something when someone asks you, then say you don't know. Even Jesus, when he was asked about the, his return in the end times, he said, the Son of Man doesn't know, only God the Father knows, right? 
Um, you could always tell someone, hey, I'll look into it, as long as you're telling the truth that you're going to look into it. But listen, you're not going to help anyone by faking it. Okay? It's important that we are clear with people. As I heard from one paleontologist one time, he said, we need to be clear about what we know, what we think we know, and what we don't know, and then to distinguish between those for people. That's our job. So we need to be honest. Secondly, we need to be humble. You know, I think almost every apologetics group out there probably uses 1 Peter 3.15 as one of their key verses, right? But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. But we stop there. I've heard so many people stop there, but the verse keeps going. It says, yet with gentleness and reverence. Listen, we shouldn't be yelling at people or getting angry with people over creation evolution issues. Think about it. Why are you a Christian if you are a Christian? Or why are you a creationist? Is it because you're smarter than other people? Well, no. If you're a Christian, it's because God changed your heart. God rescued you from the domain of darkness. If you're a creationist, it's because God opened up his word to you and, and you wouldn't have figured it out without his special revelation. Listen to me. Christianity leaves no room for pride whatsoever. We need to be humble. And finally, we need to be patient. Listen, we don't have all the answers right now. So you know what? You're going to have to wait for good creationist scientists to do the hard work, the in-depth research to understand these things, right? As, as nice it would be to just be able to pick it up and say, oh, there's a problem? Here, let me think for two minutes and come up with an answer. That's not how science works. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes money. It takes all these things over time, and slowly we get answers. But you say, well, I don't really like waiting. Well, I mean, who does, right? So what can you do while you're waiting? Well, listen to me. Number one, you can pray. Pray for creationist organizations and specifically the scientists out there doing the research. Number two, you could do science. You could become a scientist yourself and help scientists um, do this work or help students who want to become scientists. Help them get into universities like, for instance, the Master's University where I teach, um, where we have geoscience program and an environmental science program and a biology program, including paleontology. Get them out here. If they want to study science, get them studying science from a foundation of God's word. So you can pray, you can do science, and you can also stay informed. You can try to stay involved in the latest updates to creation science um, so that you can be better prepared. Now, you might think, wow, that was a letdown. I was really hoping he was going to provide some answers. Okay, well, guess what? Your patience in part has begun to pay off, okay? Because um, at the uh, Creation Biology Society annual conference, uh, where we have our origins meeting every summer, um, I have taken some students out there and we've been doing research and presenting at this meeting about this very issue. Um, so, so far we have about five published abstracts um, on these um, creatures and in trying to understand them from a creationist perspective. And so I'm going to give you a little glimpse into that world next and, you know, we'll talk about what it all means. And to do it, we need to use something called barominology. Now, barominology is a uniquely creationist um, discipline. It's the study of created kinds. And with barominology, you get like crazy plots like this. Okay. <laughs> you look at this thing and you're like, what are we looking at? Um, so let me help you. Okay. I'm um, trying to understand what's happening. So down on the left side here, you can see this list of different animal names and these are all cynodonts. Okay. Um, and imagine with me that list of names also along the top here or the bottom if you prefer. Um, and you see this line going down the middle. It's a mirror right? This side is reflected over here, okay? So if you remember back in the day when people used road atlases and you would have these little like things that look kind of like this up in the corner with mileages in them, okay? And you'd look at like, okay, how far is it drive from Montreal to Rochester, right? And then you'd like take both of those and meet, make them meet and that would be the mileage between them, okay? And it's the same idea here. So how does oligokyphus compare with oligokyphus? Oh, sorry, actually it's over here, sorry. How does it compare with the Ligokyphus? Well, it compares perfectly because it is a Ligokyphus. That'd be weird, right? How far is it from Montreal to Montreal? It's <laughs> no distance at all, unless the bridges are out. And that was a bad experience. Okay, anyway. Um, so, but how does the Ligokyphus compare with, say, um, somebody down here? Uh, it's hard for me to read the names. Divinia or something like that. Um, we have this circle here. And so the, the positive... Um, the square here represented what we call positive correlation, where it means there's good continuity. It's very similar. Oligokyphus is very similar to oligokyphus. 
It's also very similar to Cantotherium, Tritilodon, and other animals like that. That's not shocking because they're all placed in the same family, Tritilodon today. But Oligokyphus and Cantotherium, these other guys are very different from animals down here, okay? Um, and so they have these circles here, which mean negative correlation, which we interpret as discontinuity. And the goal of baronology is that you want to find a group that is discontinuous, it's separated out from every other group, and within it, there's continuity. And your hope is that that's approximating the created kind, okay? And so what we see here is, this is not a continuous series. Even within Cynodontia, I don't see one continuous unbroken chain from the most mammal-like ones to the least mammal-like one. I can see what look like three or four different groups here that have discontinuity between them. And when we look at another way to visualize these data, um, which is called multidimensional scaling, um, you can see here I've color-coded the different families or the different groups. I should say that but they're not really all families, um, but the different um, squares here are represented as different colors. So this yellow one is this square up there, and um, this red one is the one right there, and then the green and blue are these guys. And you can see that there's clearly different groups here, and those groups are not continuous with each other. They're continuous within the group, but there's discontinuity between them. And that's what we would predict as creationists. So that's really cool. And we found this wasn't just cynodonts, but every one of the non-mammalian therapsid groups, we could see clear discontinuity between them. The six subtaxa are six real groups. That makes sense. And actually we can see even um, discontinuity sometimes within the group. Sometimes there's, there's uh, other ones that may be created kinds. And this is not shocking when you really stop and think about it, because um, if you know anything about the fossil record of these creatures, um, when you look at their appearance, right? So um, there are the, the six therapsid groups. This one's essentially a uh, But You can see these, these six groups here. And um, there's a really cool paper from 2009 written by a guy named T.S. Kemp, who's one of the, the world experts on, on therapsids. And um, Kemp, he's an, he's an evolutionist, but he wrote this paper where he's talking about how did the major groups, the six major groups of therapsids evolve? And how do they appear in the false record and things? And he said, I can't find a way to connect most of them. I, I can see how cynodonts would be really, um, would have come out of a therosophalian group potentially or sister taxa to them. But the rest of these, everybody argues on their relationship. And when you actually look at their fossil record, right? So in the middle Permian here, all these guys just suddenly pop into existence at about the same time. The only ones really don't are the cynodonts. All the rest of them show up essentially simultaneously in the fossil record fully formed as distinct groups, very much the way you see, and actually Kemp says this in the paper, it's a lot like the Cambrian explosion and like the Paleogene explosion of mammals and birds. And so I look at that and I'm like, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'd expect to see as a creationist. That's, that's exciting. Uh, we would expect to see these different created kinds of them. And the reason that we're finding them in the fossil record we are is that's when that environment was buried. Um, when it was preserved uh, in the fossil record. And we would assume from the flood, um, although there's, you know, creations that argue about that, but I think that this is representative of flood deposits. So what we found in our barometrological analyses and in, you know, looking at other evidences of discontinuity from the literature and things was that there's not a continuous unbroken series from pelicosaurs to mammals. In fact, we found discontinuity around every one of these groups. And even in the cynodont group leading to things that we call mammals. So that's cool. That's exciting. That's what I would want to see, like I said, as a creationist. However, this doesn't actually answer all the questions. Because for instance, we still have this question of why do they even look transitional at all? Right? I mean, I can sit here and draw lines in the sand between different groups, but I can still line up those groups into some kind of meaningful series. So why is that? Well, when you think about the animals of today, there's basically five groups of vertebrate animals, right? We have birds, we have mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and fish, okay? And, you know, those groups were named um, and discussed in taxonomy. Everyone agreed on them. No one was like, is this bird a mammal or not? You know, it was very clear, right, among our living animals. And so what we expected was when we looked at the fossil record that all the animals would neatly fit into these groups. But what we actually found was something very different. Yes, many animals do. You can find lots of extinct birds and extinct mammals and extinct amphibians and stuff. 
But you can also find animals that kind of look like fish and kind of look like amphibians, or animals that kind of look like amphibians and kind of look like reptiles, or animals that kind of look like reptiles and kind of look like mammals, like we just talked about, or animals that kind of look like reptiles and kind of look like birds. Now, an evolutionist could look at this and say, yeah, duh, evolutionary tree, it's a phylogeny, right? But that's one possible interpretation of what we see. Maybe we're seeing something different. We're seeing a larger design picture than we previously knew. And I find that exciting. And so at this zoomed out scale, yeah, I can see all these trajectories and connections and everything. And the divisions aren't very clear. Let's stop and think about it. Is that really expected? Or sorry, is that really unexpected? Okay. I mean, if you had like a whole bunch of different types of animals together, right? You know, a pig and a jellyfish and you know, um, a crab and a fluke and, you know, all these different things, right? And then you had a tree in there. I mean, all of those animals are going to look so much more like each other than any of them are to a tree when you study them, okay? It all depends on your scale you're at, right? When you're zoomed in, I mean, I can tell the difference between me and the other three guys who are presenting or, you know, who are on this video with me. And, you know, we have no problem telling people apart unless they're like identical twins or something, right? Or weird doppelgangers. Um, but at the same time, I also recognize all as humans. So I can see discontinuity in individuals. I can also see discontinuity around our species and continuity within our species. So any method of creation, systematics, a way of thinking about living things, has to involve both continuity and discontinuity. And I think what's happened in the past is that Creationists have been too focused on the discontinuity side of things. No, species fixity, right? And evolutionists have been too focused on the continuity side of things, grand tree of life. When we really need to consider both of those options and think of life more as like an orchard, more of little trees, so that there would be a dog tree and a cat tree and things like that, um, which, you know, the idea is not that you would go and pick a cat or a dog off of a tree, but that you would see it as a family tree of those animals, foxes, wolves, dogs, coyotes, dingoes, you know, bush dogs, raccoon dogs, all those things would have a common ancestor that would have gotten off the ark, okay? So how do we make sense with the big picture? Well, let's think about mammals for a minute. Okay, this is a bat, in case you, you didn't know that. Um, we can detect a real group of animals that we call mammals, including things like bats, whales, red pandas, and wombats, which have no relationship to bat. I don't, I don't know why they're called wombats, actually. Um, could call them a wombat if you wanted, um, but yeah, we call them wombats. Anyway, regardless, these animals all have fur. They produce milk. They usually give birth to live young, all the ones up there do. But when a creationist says an animal is a mammal, like a bat, right? We're not saying that a bat and a whale share a common ancestor with other mammals, like wombats or red pandas. What we're seeing here are different created kinds of the mammal group. And you know what? When you add fossil mammals to this, you find some really interesting things, but it doesn't really change your picture. You can still see unique created kinds of, of mammals. Now, that doesn't mean it's easy, right? It requires scientific work and hard work sorting through things and trying to figure it out, but, but you can divide them, you can see them. And even when you add the stem mammals, the non-mammalian synapses we've been talking about, you can still see different created kinds of these things. And so as a creationist, we need to be thinking about these terms of, you know, things like homology and analogy. And I'd love to go on a great, huge discussion on this, but we can't do it because we, you know, we need to be wrapping up. But I want you to think about that, you know, when you see similarities or differences between living things like animals, it's not always due to the same reason. Sometimes it would be due to common descent, right? But sometimes it's due to some kind of common blueprint God used in designing things. Sometimes it's convergence where it looks, you know, like the thylacine and the wolf, where you have unrelated animals that look super, super similar to each other, just like we talked about doppelgangers and humans. There could be a number of reasons why you can see similar structures and similar animals. And so that is something we have to take hold of. It's not just one reason. There could be many reasons. And the evolutionists face the same thing. They talk about a universal common descent, but they also talk about convergence as explaining things. And again, this whole complicated discussion of homoplasy. Um, biology is much more complicated than we like to think. And that's okay. It's good. Because God made it. So in conclusion, there are different created kinds of mammal-like reptiles. I'm very confident of this from the bear work we've been doing. And we don't need to be scared of animals that look transitional. It's, 
not a problem. Um, we might expect. In fact, when you look at the Middle Ages, they talked about a great chain of being, and they talked about they imagined all these you know bizarre animals and, and people and things that could have existed, and many of them don't. But they were perfectly fine with the possibility that those things could exist. It's only because of evolution that suddenly we're really scared of things that look like other things, right? Um, but there's nothing wrong with saying something looks more like something else than it does something else. You know, take your kids to the zoo. Or if you don't have any kids, take someone else's. No, it's kidnapping, right? Don't do that. Um, go to the zoo, right? And what animal looks the most like a person? Tell a kid, go find it, quick. They're not going to come back with a trout or a lobster or, you know, a tapeworm. They're going to come back. What kind of zoo has tapeworms? All right. They're going to come back with a monkey or a chimpanzee, a gorilla, something like that, right? There's nothing wrong with saying that we look more like them than we do a tapeworm or a fish or a lobster. Um, we need to reclaim these kinds of ideas in creationist biology. And we don't need to be scared of scientific discoveries. Um, this was a cool discovery, really interesting paper. I'm still thinking a lot about, about this tritilodont they found, a cancetherium, um, this type of cyanodont that had tons and tons of babies, like an enormously high number of babies with it. And they're talking about like, how did it take care of all these babies? Like did it lay eggs? And they're going through all this discussion. They're looking at how the babies grew with the skull size. And in some ways they grew like mammals in some ways they grew like reptiles. It's a really interesting study. So I could look at that and be like, oh, that sounds like evolution. I'm going to stay away. No, we explore it. We want to understand it. And God's creations, both in the past and the present, and even in the future, they declare his glory. When I look at an animal like this Plosaurus here, this fantastically huge dicynodont that one person could ride if they wanted, that's really, really amazing. Um, we should be desiring to look at these things and understand them regardless of the creation evolution debate. This is God's world he made, and we have the responsibility to go out there and see it and learn it and, and be amazed by it and glorify him as a result and worship him. And so I say, go at it. And so if you're out there right now and you're like, hey, this stuff interests me. I want to study this stuff. Listen, talk to me. Like, we're looking for more creationist scientists. We're looking for people to go out there and find these discoveries and make these, you know, figure these things out. Because the reality is, listen, we don't have all the answers yet on synapses. We just barely scratched the surface. And yes, we found what looked like different creative kinds, but you know what? We still haven't explained the stratigraphy problem. Why do they look most mammal-like among the cynodonts at the top versus at the bottom? That's another question we have to investigate. How does this relate with development? How does this relate with genetics? There's so many things to explore and that's exciting. It's not bad, it's good. That's what's great about doing science is there's so many things to investigate and you get to glorify God as you do it. And what, a, what better way is there you know, to, to explore and to worship God than I think like looking at his creation and, and glorifying him. It's fantastic. And so my encouragement to you is, is be encouraged as you look at science. Don't be afraid of it. Um, even, you know, when you hear evolutionists talk about things, don't just, you know, get in the fetal position and give up. Um, trust that God is going to work through people and maybe you are one of those people. Um, and that's exciting and we can glorify God together. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dr. McClellan. Okay. looks like we're good. looks like we're good. Um, I got, I got to say that was a great presentation and, and I've seen your previous presentation, so I cannot recommend them um, any more to everybody. I mean, they have to see them. I, I love your style. And um, this particular topic is, is so interesting. And um, in regards to your presentation, I, I love the visuals. And the barominology work showing um, these barriers, this discontinuity that, that you talk about is, is fascinating. Now, two things I will say, and, and then I'll yield the mic uh, for some questions. Um, but looking at these creatures, Dr. McLean, um, lo looking at God's amazing creation, and, and I've heard you, you, you say this before in, in a previous presentation, but it, it makes me think that... When you look to these movies, these movie creators, they're always trying using CGI, right? To come up yeah. with the coolest looking creatures. And yet these movie creators can't come up with anything nearly as cool as, as what already exists in the fossil record in God's creation. And, and with your field, it, it's so cool that, that you get to, um, you know, study these types of creatures and, and come to these amazing conclusions. And the last thing I'll say too, is in terms of design, I, I feel like we're in the infancy of recognizing design. 
because you were talking about transitional forms, you know, and, and why we should not be afraid of these transitional like creatures. Well, even, even man today, human designers seem to be building more transitional types of vehicles. I've heard creationists before talk about like these crossover SUVs or in the military, you've got something called an amphibious assault vehicle, which yeah. technically blends the features of a land vehicle and a vehicle built for the ocean. So we're seeing a reflection of that, I feel, in, mm -hmm. in uh, the biological world. I mean, we're made in, in the image of God. So it would make sense that that we could recognize that type of design in the um, in the biological world. So I, I mean, I can go on and on, and, and that was such a great presentation. So I really appreciate that, Dr. McLean. Um, now we do have a ton of questions, so I'm not going to hog the mic. Uh, Matt, raw Matt, Brother Guzman, if you guys had anything to say in terms of the presentation, and. Um, then we can get to some audience questions or a uh, gentleman, I think you're muted. So uh, sure. yeah, go ahead. If you guys have anything to say. Well, I'll let Matt go first. Uh, sure. sure. Uh, yeah. You've mentioned that there were six different types of uh, therapsids and uh, did they all have inner ear bones? Oh yeah. Good question. So, you know, the six basic groups of them you see, and like I said, those aren't necessarily created kinds. There's probably more created kinds than those six groups, but um, yeah, so they only had one inner ear bone, um, the stapes, uh, most of them. So just like what you'd see in a reptile, it's like this kind of rod um, structure. Uh, when you get to your cynodonts, there are some of them that would have had um, probably some hearing associated with the lower jaw. And it's, it's still um, something that's like really being studied a lot because it's, it's kind of a foreign structure to us. And so trying to understand exactly how they hear is, is a, it's a cool problem to look into, but um, they're, I would all that to say their hearing would be a little bit more complicated than what you see with the typical um, condition in therapsids. Okay. All right. Um, I liked your chart that showed the uh, multidimensional scaling. And I was wondering, like, uh, is that like a program uh, uh, that we could run? Like, I don't know what the criteria is yeah. based on how you can differentiate, but uh, is it like Mendel's accountant, for example, where we can type in and see what would be related ourselves? Yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, anyone interested in that, like there's a lot of literature on how to do baronology um, and, and uh, you know, there's a, there's a good book uh, by Todd Wood and uh, Murray, I can't remember her first name, um, from 2003 called Understand the Pattern of Life. But basically there's, there's a software package. It's kind of, it's an app that you can use on the, uh, um, the core Academy of Science um, website. And it's called, um, used to be called BDIST MDS, which is, yeah, now it's called Barclay, so that's easier to say. Um, but uh, you can use that in conjunction with other software like Mage. Um, and Mage was designed to like represent 3D molecules and stuff, but you can put anything in there that you want to represent 3D and it, and it works pretty well. So yeah, it's um, anyone who's interested in that, you know, let me know and I can, I can direct you to ways to use that stuff. Awesome, okay. All right, Guzman, you want to go? Because I'll just keep going, man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Definitely. Um, yeah, so uh, I, th I think what was interesting, um, I, I also had a question about the baromenology thing. So um, you identified uh, three, possibly four different created kinds of um, cynodonts. Was that it? Yeah, non-mammalian cynodonts. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So... Um, I, I was also I was also wondering, um, would it be possible that um, the like convergent evolution could affect those results? Yes. So um, there's a lot of interesting things going on with the rhapsids, and a lot of people see. I, I wanted to get into this in the presentation, but I was like, this is going way too long. But <laughs> this is what's really interesting to me. So when you look at like cynodonts, for instance, everyone focuses on them because they show that transition, right? But if you go back to the early 1900s, late 1800s. Uh, many people thought that actually one of the other therapsid groups, the Therocephalians, were the ancestors of mammals because they also get a bony secondary palate. They have a lot of other features that you find convergently in cynodonts. And so you've got these examples in therapsida of, of different animal groups doing the same things independently, which is really weird. Um, I've got a student right now working on hands and feet of therapsids because they do something really funky where like um, our condition right? For hands. So, you know, you've got like uh, your thumb is two bones, 
right? And then you got three, 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 oh, three, <laughs> you got five fingers, okay. Um, and that's what you find in mammals, most mammals. Um, reptiles, like my bearded dragon, he'll do something more like, it's like two, three, four, five, four, or something like that, I can't remember the exact number, um, of bo the bones in the fingers. Um, and you would think when you look at therapsids, you'd see some kind of transition between those two states, and you do. But you see it in, I believe, every one of the individual six groups. If not, it may be like four or five of them. But like cyanodonts are doing it, but so are Gorgonopsians, so are Dinosphalians, so are the other ones. And it's like, why does every group seem to show a transition to the mammalian hand when only one of them is actually going to mammals? That's really, really interesting. And I don't feel like anyone's really investigated that to any kind of um, satisfaction, in my opinion. And so you can find, like, for instance, um, like I got a Gorgonopsian right here. It's one of these guys. One of their hands, um, some of them, they will have lots of bones in them, in the fingers, but the bones will actually be tiny little discs. Okay, so it looks like they're in the act of disappearing. And so that's really, really interesting. And like I said, we're still, like, working on exactly what that means. And so that'll be, like, upcoming stuff to watch for. That's great. And is that uh, like a problem for like the evolutionary side or is it more of a problem for us or? I, I think it's, yeah, it depends what you mean by problem. Really I think it's, it is for both in a sense um, because okay. the evolutionist, um, you have to ask the question, why is everything kind of converging on this mammal condition, but just some more than others? Like I would expect like one lineage to do it, but why is every lineage doing it? That's really, really bizarre. Um, from a creationist perspective, we need to explain why it's happening at all, right? Why can I find some Gorgonopsians that have more reptile-like hands and some with more mammal-like hands? Um, and I think that that's, um, that's a really cool question to investigate. Um, if I could jump in here real quick, if you don't mind, uh, yeah. Guzman, because the, the, yeah, no everything you're saying, yeah, and with what you're saying with convergent evolution, we know that... Um, as compared to us, the, the, the evolutionists would say that everything shares ancestry, right? Ultimately, universal right. common ancestry. So since we know today that there's oftentimes more variation, even within the same species than across or between species, mm -hmm. for the evolutionists, um, and in a sense, I guess us too, is it then oftentimes difficult to recognize in the fossil record what is maybe the result of recent relationship versus say convergent evolution? If that, if that makes sense. Yeah, that yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, it very much can be. Um, so, you know, you're only, when you're working with fossils, you're working with a very limited data set, right? Um, because you only have typically bones for vertebrates. Um, you may occasionally get, you know, like soft tissue impressions or things, but um so there are lots of cases where people have thought, oh, these belong together in a group, right? And actually, oh no, someone says, no, 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 actually those belong over there. And there's still many of those where they're unsettled and they can't really figure out, you know, is this convergence or is it actual homology? Um, and uh, I think that that is very telling. And what everyone was hoping was when they moved to genetics, you know, doing molecular genetics and, and doing phylogeny based on genes and proteins, that that would disappear. Oh, we're gonna, you know, problem solved. And it turns out, oh, actually, there are lots of examples of convergence in genes too. Um, and right. so I think that it's just showing us that um, both the species fixity, the old creationist idea, and the tree of life of Darwin, those are these are too simplistic um, to really actually explain life. Um, and the one, and I think both of them have wrong starting assumptions. Um, and so, you know, we need to, um, as creationists, we need to be informed by what scripture says, and then we also need to actually look at what we see in the science. And I think we'll right. get some other kind of pattern. Right. Right. I, I think some some critics, at least in the past, too, they assume that as young earth creationists, we we um, believed in the fixity of species, you know, yeah. that, that species are fixed. But with these ever changing environments, I've heard Dr. Todd Wood say this with ever changing environments, demands or requires ever changing genomes. Yeah. Right. The sure. ability to adapt only may only make sense. Um, so that's a great response. I'll, I'll ask this question and, and then I'll yield because I think a lot of this comes down to um, cladistics, ta taxonomy, and, and, and these nested hierarchical patterns in general. W would you say, and I've heard you speak on this in great detail, 
are these nested hierarchical patterns, these groups within groups patterns, uh, Dr. McLean, that we see in the biological world? Are they only evidence for universal common descent, as, as the evolutionary community would say? No, I mean, they weren't interpreted that way for hundreds of years, you know, before you had these evolutionary discussions popping up in the 17, 1800s, right? So um, when you look at creationists in the 1700s and 1800s, they're, they will talk about like a tree of life, but they don't mean it in terms of actual descent. They're just talking about the way things are organized. You know, Linnaeus was the one who really um, put his brand on the idea of nested hierarchies, right? Um, really, and he was a creationist. So no, it's, that is one way to interpret it. But what we're told very often in, in kind of the evolutionary setting is this is the, the only way, you know, um, but no, there's there's certainly other ways to interpret it. And, you know, what's frustrating for me is you'll hear sometimes like evolutionists talk about like, oh, the fact that we can make a phylogeny, you know, we can make an evolutionary tree of universal common descent means it must have been that way. Because if there were separate creations, we wouldn't be able to make a tree. And it's like, no, like that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, you could make a tree. You can make a tree of anything. and you know, they assume, oh, if God actually did make separate kinds of animals, that they'd be like drastically different. And there's no chance we'd mistake them as being related. And it's like, well, right. how could an ecosystem function like that? Right. And plus, then we'd start into some kind of weird polytheistic thinking, right? That it's like, oh, this God is the God of dogs, but this God is the God of lobsters, you know, that for an ecosystem to function, you've got to have that, um, you know, to be able to, to break down certain things and intake certain things. And so we've got to be all based on the same basic stuff. From the beginning you know so I, I think it's just very simplistic thinking um you know leading people to say oh this can be the only possibility i agree that's a great response it's very simplistic because by definition god would have had to create some creatures more similar to other creatures like humans and say the great apes and other creatures less similar Right. So these groups within groups patterns seems like it would be uh, characteristics of design and a necessity anyways. Um, I, I do have a question here from the audience and then uh, Matt and Guzman, I know you have a couple of questions of your own, but I'll um, I'll pop this one up on screen because it's related to the synapsids. And we've had a great chat, ton of good questions. So I appreciate it, guys. Uh, question for Dr. McLean. Can you explain what type of pre-flood environment the non-mammalian synapses lived in? So first of all, hi, Ryan. Um, second of all, um, yeah, that's a great question. So um, when you look at the uh, the typical paleoenvironmental interpretation for like the, the Karoo Basin, for instance, you know, it's supposed to be a, a river environment and you can see the river changing over time. Um, but how much of that is influenced by flood processes, that's difficult to tell. You know, you do have animals burrowing and stuff like that, but um, I'm not sure how confident we can be that these are long-term environments. Um, so what I can say is on a very broad perspective, okay, when you're in the Carboniferous um, and into the, the, the lower Permian, that's where you find all these coal forests, right? Um, and that's where you got things like Dimetrodon um, and all these Pelicosaurs. Those animals are probably living in some extension of what Kurt Wise has talked about, a floating forest environment. Um, and so if you want to learn more about that, Kurt's the person to talk to. He's got some great stuff. Um, these uh, therapsids, however, kind of like middle Permian and onward, um, they don't appear to be in those environments. Um, there are different kinds of plants, different kinds of settings. So um, there are certainly more terrestrial um, overall. And um, my suspicion is that the Permian therapsids and the communities that are there are not overlapping with the Triassic ones, um, which is where you find just a few therapsids left with more dinosaurs and crocodilians, or not crocodilians, but crocodile-like animals. Um, and so there's probably multiple environments represented in there um, that are preserved on top of each other. And so, um, you know, I think it's still a question. We have a lot of investigation that we need to go into, but I can say there's, there's at least kind of three broad strokes to it. Um, but going more detailed than that is going to require a lot more work. That's a great response. I appreciate that. Um, Matt Guzman, if you guys had a question. Matt, you go ahead. All right. Um, now, because I haven't I got to investigate and see what's been done in verminology, uh, have you guys run anything that uh, you know is related? Now, I don't know for sure if you consider Neanderthal related to human beings, but we have enough of their skeletons now that have you guys uh, done the classification because 
I don't, I, I really don't know if we have enough of um, <laughs> Denisovan. Now I know there's just a little bit of tooth in a jaw or something, but not much. But for Neanderthal, we have quite a bit. Have you done uh, the ran it in the program to see if it's classified as a human being? Yeah, great question. So um, yeah, a lot of the early baromenology work actually was done on groups where we did know a lot about hybridization data, right? So um, for instance, uh, you could look at um, waterfowl or camels or grasses or things like that, where we've done experiments and we know, you know, okay, llamas and camels can interbreed, you know, alpacas and this can interbreed. And so um, when they did the baromenology results, sure enough, yeah, they're, they're showing for the most part consistent patterns. So um, the person who's done the most baromenology work on, on humans and, and other hominids um, is Todd Wood. And he's done a lot of work on this. And yeah, Neanderthals, Denisovans, these are, well, Denisovans you can't really include because there's not much information, but um, Neanderthals for sure are always clustering with Homo sapiens. Um, and so he's got a lot of really good um, articles on that in, um, in Answers Research Journal and Journal Creation Theology and Science. Um, and uh, the there might be an Institute for Creation, or no, um, International Conference on Creationism, uh, one I can't remember, but um, you know, uh, I can definitely direct you to some of those if you're interested, but you know, um, if you are of European or Asian descent, you have Neanderthal DNA in you. Um, and you know, like I did my 23andMe and you know, it's telling me like what, what, uh, um, you know, base pairs and things are linked with Neanderthals. And so, um, you know, we have every reason to think these are humans, um, and baromenology is showing us the same kind of thing. Yeah. You just would be surprised how many people still think they're a subhuman class there are a lot of people like that yes yeah just based on a couple morphological differences you know they say the chin angle that brow ridges the longer skull right. so just wanted to know that was all guzman you are up yeah hey uh so uh my next question is um so i know about the floating forest hypothesis i think uh icr actually disagrees with dr weiss on that yeah. um i haven't read the article I don't know what all the evidence is on that, but um, on the same note, um, well, not not nearly on the same note, but it's still in in terms of geology and stuff. Do you have like a solid or well, we can't be solid on on, on too many things, but do you have like an opinion on like index fossils? What, what's like um, what's up there with index fossils and stuff? You know, that is the one thing. If I, if I could tell any creationist what you need to go into, what do you need to study, it's biostrategy. That is our <laughs> thing we are ignorant of and we don't just don't go into it enough. Um, everybody's obsessed with radiometric dating. And I'm like, I get that. I understand why that's important. I'm not saying you shouldn't be concerned about that and trying to understand it. But biostratigraphy is just as, um, as important to discuss. And there's really very few people who have even tried to tackle this. Um, I'm a vertebrate paleontologist. And most index fossils are inverts, so I don't really deal with them. Um, but it's obviously, or, or plants too, um, or plankton or things. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's a really big issue. And um, you know, as creationists, um, we do need to look into them because it works. You can you can correlate layers across continents based on the trilobites or conodonts or you know ammonoids or whatever they are. And um, I think it's it's. Um, something that creationists really need to take more seriously and go into. Um, so at this point, no, I don't have a lot of good answers for that. Um, I, I think I have a, a good question that would uh, could branch off that a little bit because um, I watched a number of your presentations and I believe this was from your presentation specifically on the fossil record. Um, I believe at the same conference where you spoke on the synapsids and you discussed the Cambrian explosion yeah, uh, really well, actually, and how it is uh, a, a major problem for for the naturalist, uh, for the evolutionist. Could you touch on that a little bit, Dr. McLean? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the um, I think the easiest way to start thinking about this is, um, you know, think about your taxonomy you learned in, in high school or middle school biology. Right. You have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Right. Um, so right below the level of kingdom is the level phylum. This is a, an assortment of tons and tons of different types of animals in a single category, right? So for instance, our phylum is chordata, and that's all of your, um, you know, mammals, birds, reptiles, fish, um, as well as sharks, as well as things like lampreys and hagfish, and even things that don't have bones like sea squirts, okay, are all in the same phylum. So this is a huge group. Um, so there are something around 
25 to 30 phyla probably um, that we know of. Um, and when you think about the way Darwin predicted evolution would work, right? And what you'd see in the fossil record is um, that um, the idea is what we call diversity preceding disparity. So um, you imagine there's a single organism, right? And it's, you know, reproducing and stuff. And you get one that's slightly different. Maybe there's a, something that separates them, right? And they become two different species, but they're still really similar looking, right? And over time, those make, you know, four species or eight species or whatever. And they're still pretty similar looking creatures. And it takes millions and millions of years before you get something that looks really, really different than something else, okay? And so the idea would be you'd start with more similar things and you'd end with very different things, okay? And that's what I mean when we say diversity preceding disparity. So diversity is a measure of variation within a group. So for instance, um, you know, the four of us, we're not an incredibly diverse group, um, but, you know, if you were to take all of our listeners, there's probably, um, you know, male and female, there's probably people of all kinds of different nationalities or backgrounds or whatever. Um, so um, that would be diversity, but disparity would be, let's think about every living thing that's in our rooms right now. Okay. So yes, there's us, maybe some of you have plants in your rooms. I don't know. Um, but you've got bacteria, you've got little, um, you know, dust mites and spiders and all kinds of things that might be around, right? Well, we're incredibly different from dust mites or, you know, bacteria or plants. Um, and so that's disparity, talking about, you know, these, these vast differences between things. Um, and so Darwin says diversity has to come first. Little variations are going to lead to very big differences over time. That's the evolutionary tree, right? But when you look at the first fossils of animals, of definite animals, okay, so we go to the Cambrian, um, there are these deposits in Canada and in China in particular, um, the Burgess Shale and the Changjiang Biota, um, and you can go to these places and there's just hundreds and hundreds of exceptionally preserved aquatic animals, marine animals, and there's from over 20 different phyla, all there. And that's how the fossil record essentially begins for animals. There is some Precambrian stuff. We'll get to that in a minute. But um, when you go there, you find these things that are drastically different: trilobites and clams and um, echinoderms and even some chordate type things, some worms and all kinds of different types of stuff. Just boom, it's there suddenly in the Cambrian. And Darwin knew about something like this. He didn't know about those particular deposits, but he knew that the fossil record suddenly started with different types of animals. And he talks about that in Origin of the Species. And he says, you know, this is a challenge to my model if precursors for these things are not found in lower layers and what we call the Precambrian today. So that's what everybody said. Okay, the sudden appearance of all these different phyla just randomly, kaboom, they're there. Well, it's got to just be that the layers beneath, we don't have good preservation. That's the problem, right? Well, since then, we found these things called the Ediacaran biota, and they've been found on like all across the world, starting in Australia. Um, and there's tons and tons of these soft-bodied creatures of some kind. But they're really hard to place. There's a few we think might be animals now, but we just don't know what they are. And none of them look anything like you find in the Cambrian. They're just completely different things. So it's not a preservation problem because if it were, you should find the ancestors of these animals in the Cambrian, but you don't. And so now the majority of evolutionists are saying the Cambrian explosion is a real evolutionary event where basically you had very few types of animals before the event. And then in a span of just 10 to 30 million years, you have this explosion of different types of body plans just popping onto the scene. Okay. Um, and so that is like, imagine an evolutionary tree for a minute, cut off the trunk and all the lower branches and just get rid of it. And that's what you have with the Cambrian explosion. You just have all these upper branches preserved. And so it's the complete opposite of the, of Darwin's prediction. It is disparity. The difference is already being placed preceding diversity. Um, and so that's why it's a, it's a big challenge, I think, for the evolutionary perspective. Yeah, that's a great, that's a really good response. Um, I remember you saying in that presentation that even some of the evolutionists are saying that a lot of the animals found in the, in, in the area with, with the Cambrian explosion were transferred from different environments through yep. moving water, which would be similar to the global flood. I, I hope I'm representing that right. Is that, are, are they almost yeah, leaning? There's more? been discussion ahead. that like, you know, when you think about like the Burgess Shale in Canada, for instance, they're obviously were buried very rapidly and pretty much everybody agrees on that. Um, there's some kind of like a mudslide or, or underwater debris flow or something. Um, big mass movement. 
And so, yeah, I, I've seen some evolutionists talk about the possibility that these things may have been transported for hundreds of kilometers um, under the seafloor, which is really cool. Um, right. And they did some really cool experiments actually where they took um, uh, polychaete worms and some other creatures and they put them in like these tumbler things with sand and water in it. And they just kept tumbling them for the equivalent of transporting like 12 or 20 kilometers. And the animals could just pop out, out like nothing happened, which is crazy. But if they transported a dead one, they could transport it long distances and it would stay together as a fossil. Well, eventually we'll turn into a fossil and stay together as an animal. It's only when it deteriorates, when it starts to decay, that it falls apart during transport. Um, and so that's some really interesting research, I think, that um, you know we need to be thinking about in terms of a global flood. Yeah. So if, the, if this is a specific community, then according to our model being buried during the flood, the ordering of the, of the fossil record, how would we best explain that? Would it be partly due to burial of communities, ecosystems? I mean, it, what would be your, your best answer for that? Yeah, I think there's a certain level at which we are still, we still know way too little to even like start planning out how that worked, right? Obviously, like there's two kinds of people in the world, right? People want to like take always look at the big picture, right? And there's people that always want to look at the tiny details. Um, right. you need, okay, so um, I would say, you know, if the Cambrian deposits are flood, which is what most creationists think, um, then yeah, I think you're looking at some of the initial stuff that's getting buried um, as you're having um, tectonic events and stuff in the ocean basins that you know you're getting loose debris that's coming down and you know moving these things and burying them and. Um, but how is it that we get community stacked on top of community? I mean, that's, that's a challenging question and that's going to require a lot more creationists, you know? And so a lot of times people want answers to these things like now, you know, and it's like, yeah. well, we only have, you know, a handful of creationist paleontologists out there and they're doing very specific projects that don't touch on that or they can't get to that point yet. And so, you know, it's going to be a long time coming, I think, but it's worth it. It's worth it. it. It's a lot of fun. I'll I'll, I'll ask this one question, and then I'll, I'll yield for some uh, questions from Guzman and and Matt because this just came to me and it's relevant to your presentation. From the um, evolutionary explanation for synapsids and the mammal-like reptiles in general, from my understanding, the Permian extinction event was a massive extinction event, but it was it was the reign of the dinosaurs afterwards which means w would they say that that some synapsids survived alongside the dinosaurs and then would have eventually evolved in, into mammals after the Triassic? I hope I'm asking that correctly, but I'm just curious how, how would they, if there was a, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So basically, you know, you have your, your synapsid, we'll talk about the therapsids, right? Those pop up in the Permian. Okay. You have the right. Permian Triassic okay. extinction and it wipes out um, several therapsid groups like Organopsians, like this guy back here. Um, but Three lineages are found on both sides, or three of the subtaxa. So you have the dicynodonts are across, um, the th therocephalians, and the cynodonts. And so you can find them in the Triassic, and dicynodonts have some fun in the Triassic. Some of them get really big, up to the size of like small elephants and stuff. Um, and you have um, your cynodonts get more and more mammal like. When I was talking about like the changes in the jaw and the palate and stuff, that's happening in the time of the dinosaurs. Um, and so Mammals first appear in the Triassic, um, true mammals, and depending you talk to some people say Jurassic. Um, and then they're, you know, the classic image, they're living in the shadows, you know, waiting for the yeah. dinosaurs to meet their demise, right? They're like hiding in their little nocturnal um, lives. And, you know, since then we've learned actually that Mesozoic mammals are a really diverse group of things. You've got some that glide, you've got some aquatic ones, um, but your biggest mammal we have so far from dinosaur deposits is about the size of like a, a raccoon. So not like a monster. What's funny though, it's called um, Repenomamus, uh, I think it's like Giganticus or something like that. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it doesn't work here, like, it's not that impressive, but well, for a Mesozoic mammal, it's really impressive. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of the story of what's going on there. Okay. Well, you answered it perfectly. Yeah, the, that's the answer that, that I was looking for because it was a curious yeah. thought um, after watching your presentation. Um, I, I could ask questions all day, I'll, I'll yield to, uh, uh, Matt, if you had a question or a comment, brother. Uh, sure. I just wanted to ask mostly because other young earth creationists are going to watch this and they're going to have probably the, the two typical questions like, uh, where does baromenology place um, created kinds that God would have made, like on the family level, or genre, yeah. species level? And um, I'll, I'll let you go for that one first. 
Yeah. So um, a lot of the work on this was done by Todd Wood. Um, and, and he's found consistently that around the level of family um, is like the, the ballpark. Okay. Most of the time, the creative kind is somewhere around the level of family, but that's not always true. Sometimes it's, it's smaller. Um, so for instance, hominids would be a great example, right? Hominidae by its current definition includes chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas, australopithecines, humans, right? Uh, we don't think all of those are in the same created kind. Um, but sometimes it's also larger. Um, so uh, for instance, um, the some of the therapsid groups we're looking at, um, all of the dicynodonts might be in the same created kind. And if so, you're looking at the level of like infra order or um, you know, something super family or something, something bigger than family. Um, you know, and an aardvark might be another good example. So aardvarks are in their own order, um, which is tubula dentata. All our fossil aardvarks look like aardvarks. Um, <laughs> they don't look like anything else. And so, yeah, probably that whole order is one, you know, created kind in that case. Okay. All right. I guess I would kind of answer to the next question then in general would be how many created kinds do you, was there, do you, you thought, think God could have made a high number, but if it's on the family, then we can just extrapolate. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's a good approximation, I think, is the family. Obviously, it's not perfect, like I said. Um, you know, I honestly, like when I visited the Ark Encounter before, I was impressed with not only the, the artistic, you know, the models and stuff that they did, they're fantastic of the animals. Like the, and they've got some snapsids there, by the way. They've got um, some dicynodonts and they've got uh, like Demetrodon and um, some caseids. But, um, you know, they actually have lists in there of potential created kinds, right? Um, now, the thing is, that hasn't been extensively researched, right? It's not like somebody was like, I'm taking this family of bats and we're going to town. There's only a few groups, right, that have ever been analyzed with this stuff. Um, okay. But it at least gives you kind of an approximation of, of the numbers there. So I don't remember what the number is that they came up with off the top of my head, but, you know, you can check it out. Okay. I noticed that you also had a skull. You, um, you showed it for a moment, but I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't uh, yours uh, that you actually showed uh, or you had, but it was a picture of one and you showed okay. that um, it was, you said this is a, uh, a carnivore yeah. and it was one of the, I don't know if it was a created kind, but we, what would be your answer to if God would create an obligate carnivore and then mm -hmm. place them in an herbivore scenario? <laughs> would it be like, because we don't have the soft tissue, we can't really know if they have the sequel valve like the, Italian wall lizard, for example, that can come when they start to eat plants but disappear when they go carnivore. Is it like this scenario or we just are? So, I mean, that's a great question. And, and I think it's going to be much more complicated than we want it to be, right? I don't think it's going to be the same answer for every animal. Um, you know, and you can see that in animals today, right? You have some animals that are omnivorous, you have some that are obligate carnivores, you know, so did the omnivorous ones, did they just stumble upon eating meat? Like, hey, this is pretty good stuff, right? You know, because occasionally you'll see, you can find videos on YouTube, if, if you want to see this, of cows and deer, like eating baby birds and stuff. Right. And it's, that's weird, right? Um, but they'll do that sometimes. Or rabbits will eat each other. Um, there's weird things like that. Um, you know, so some animals maybe stumbled into that as potential calcium source and things. But some animals are clearly, I think it's fair to say they're designed to kill other animals. Um, God designed them that way. Now, was that the way it was in Eden? No, because I think the scriptures are very clear that, you know, um, the animals are having green plants for food. That's what Genesis, you know, 130 says. So um, I I suspect some animals would have had a redesign at, at the fall, um, just like he talks about thorns and thistles appearing. Maybe some animals, you know, he, he altered the way that they work to have this new ecosystem that runs on death, um, a new world that runs on death. Some animals, it may have been, you know, changes that happened after the, um, after the fall, but, you know, just kind of over time, they, they became more carnivorous. Um, but I like the idea of, you know, um, God knew what would happen, obviously, but he's going to create animals with possibilities inside them. Okay. Um, when, when, when we think about animals or plants or any organism like that, um, they're not just things in themselves, right? Because they can reproduce, which is cool, right? They can make copies of themselves. But it's not only that they make copies of themselves, they actually change over time, which is really crazy to think about how much design went into this, right? That he's programming these initial animals, these are, you know, that kind of analogy, to make all these crazy things later on that, that we couldn't even imagine would come out. Um, and so when you think along those lines, it wouldn't shock me that some of these created kinds, he's prepared them for, you know, this eventuality. Um, in the same way that, for instance, um, when you look at let's say the post-flood fossil record, okay? Um, 
you see animals going extinct and other animals taking their places. And that's a very common thing um, in the post-flood fossil record. And so it looks like this is coming back to that question of convergence. I think that God made different kinds of animals with the possibility of filling different niches should they get that opportunity is my point. Um, now, how does that play in with that initial first carnivory? Like I said, it's probably going to be complicated. Some are going to be redesigned. Some are going to be, it just appears over time. You know, there's probably several different scenarios for that. Um, yeah, actually that answers a lot of um, thoughts that I had going on looking at your presentation and looking at a lot of these um, creatures where they look like they were designed and built to essentially kill. Um, mm -hmm. But your answer really flows from scripture in that God has foreknowledge. So those um, built in mechanisms, it makes me think about epigenetics and these environmental yeah. changes. We now know that there's just paper upon paper of rapid adaptation via environment. Mm -hmm. So if, if those possibilities, as you said, or those mechanisms were front loaded in, into right. the created kinds, then just going into those new environments, especially going from a, pre-fallen world to now a fallen world, all it would take is maybe a gene being turned on, um, right. kind of trigger that response. Sure. Um, I, I had a question here from the audience actually, uh -huh. and I better get to it before it, before I lose it. So the question is Dr. McLean, and I really appreciate your, uh, your presentation and your time today. Uh, the audience is, is loving this, um, program. And the question is from Jamie. So th thank you so much, Jamie, for your question. He says, um, how precise are the apparent transitions ordered in the geological column of the synapsidae? Are they clearly separated or is there questionable layer identification? Okay. So you're asking about the stratigraphy, basically, like, you know, like I showed you that, you know, where they're, they're like becoming more mammal-like in the cynodonts over time, uh, over the layers. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So um, Permian and Triassic terrestrial stratigraphy is very difficult because um, you don't have good index fossils, as actually was brought up earlier. Um, and so you have to kind of approximate a lot of times. Um, and so like when you're, you're assuming timing wise between say for instance like something happening in south africa and something happening in russia i think we can be a little bit skeptical of that um because there's just there's more ambiguity there um however when you're actually dealing with within the basin like let's talk about the Karoo basin right now in south africa where you have deposition from either the the uppermost carboniferous or lowest permian all the way through into the triassic and stuff um we can be pretty confident about stratigraphy. They've been working on that since the 1800s and in the early 1900s, especially people like Broom and Boonstra and people like that. Um, you know, they, they assigned these faunal assemblage zones. Um, so there's like a Lystrosaurus one, a Dicynodon one, a Pristrognathus. And um, they seem to be very, very precise um, that you can match those up, I think, very, very clearly. Um, but saying all that, take a step back, many times we have species that are known from like one skull right? Or just a few bits of bones, or we name them from the skull. We're not sure what postcranium go with them. So knowing that um, just because an animal was only found in one assemblage zone doesn't mean that's the only one it ever lived in, right? Um, or that the only one that it's ever going to be found buried in. I, I think um, some, we picked the animals to define the assemblage zones based on the common ones that are there that are restricted, right? They're index fossils. Um, but you know, there's lots of other animals that are important in this discussion that, you know, they might not be exactly confined to the spaces that we'd like them to be um, in the in that model. But all that to say, I think the stratigraphy overall is pretty good for the stuff like in South Africa, for instance. OK, awesome. I, I appreciate that. Thanks for the question, Jamie. Uh, Guzman, uh, go ahead, brother. All right. Uh, so, Dr. McLean, I, I saw. Uh, the last time we talked, you briefly mentioned to me the the Origins Conference uh, hosted yep. by uh, the Journal of Creation Geology and Theology. Is that what it is? So um, there's three organizations that meet together for the Origins Conference that happens every summer. It's the Creation Biology Society, Creation Geology Society, and Creation Theology Society. And um, this year, the plan is to meet in um, upstate New York, Word of Life um in july um and i can provide links for you guys if you want to share that with the video or something but um 
it's uh, it's a really cool event because um, it's a creation science conference. The whole point is that creation scientists come and present their research and discuss their research and stuff. Um, so um, it's it's definitely a great opportunity. I don't know whether it'll be in person or not. We're planning on it, but obviously, you know, everything in the world is you know is just chaos all the time now. So um, we don't we just don't know. Um, but uh, definitely, you know, it's a, like I said, it happens every summer and it changes locations all around um, the United States. And we've even been in, um, in Europe before. Um, so, uh, really Thanks. cool opportunity. Yeah. Anyway, so, uh, and you spoke at the conference last year. Um, I actually listened to your talk. It was on, uh, uh, what, what's the. Pariah source. What was the Pariah source? Yes, that is. Yeah. Um, and. I also know that Michael Ord um, spoke mm -hmm. at the conference as well. So um, I, my question is, because I know um, Michael Ord tends to lean more towards like, a, I, I think he leans more towards um, a, a later post-flood boundary than you do. Yep. So I, wanna, I wanted to ask you, how do you identify the post-flood boundary? And do you use more paleontology than geology or vice versa? And how, what are the criteria to understand that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think the first thing to say is, um, you know, people sometimes hear things like that, like, oh, those creationists disagree. Like, that's so bad. And it's like, um, no, this is how <laughs> science works. Like, that's fine. You know, I'm I'm perfectly happy to to disagree with Mike Ord or Tim Clary or other people like that. And, and you know, we can be friends and, and we can be, um, you know, uh, treat each other as Christian brothers. And so that's, that's okay. Um, so I want to get that out of the way first. Um, but yeah, I think, um, when you're talking about the flood post flood boundary, um, there's some really good articles on this. Uh, there's one by, uh, Whitmore and Garner from, I think the 2008 ICC, uh, there's some other ones by Marcus Ross and I think around 2012 in journal of creation. Um, but, uh, and there's some recent ones from recent ICC too, from, from Andrew Snelling and some other people, but, um, you know, for me, I'm a paleontologist, so I think about the paleontology, and I think it's very convincing the flood post flood boundary being the, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary around that area. Um, you have this massive changeover in fauna. Um, you have the sudden appearance of like the modern animal groups, the mammals and birds, and those things that are there. Um, it makes sense as they're getting off the ark, they're going to start leaving fossils all over the place. So, you know, I think about from a paleontological perspective, you know, you have a pre flood world, which seems to be kind of dominated by reptiles mainly. Um, the flood is a reset, okay? And everything that's on the ark is allowed to get off. And it's like, go, right? And some things do exceptionally well and some things do not do very well. Um, and so, you know, I think what you're seeing is that mammals and birds in this new world, when they're given like equal, you know, starting place, they're on it and they're, they're all over the place. Um, so, you know, um, I see that as a really good reason for seeing that, as well as some of the, the Cenozoic diversification sequences you can see and the continental movements. For instance, the um, the settling of South America and then the Great American Biotic Interchange later on, I think are all, and the settling of Australia also. Um, if you have a late post-flood boundary, you have to have marsupials that lived in Australia, right? All these different kinds, you know, literally created kinds of marsupials were living in Australia, just chilling. Flood kills them all, right? And then the few that's right in the ark are like, you know what I really love? Australia, right? <laughs> they all just like managed to head right back. And it's like, this is weird, right? Like, I mean, are they honoring like they're dead or, you know, what, what is going on? Um, and so I think the odds are very low on that, that that would happen. Um, geologically, there's a lot of good reasons to put that boundary there too. Um, and so like I, I direct you to, like I said, uh, Whitmore and Garner's paper and also um, uh, Snelling's um, ICC paper from last ICC 2018. Um, you know, a good example is that Cenozoic environments and, and depositional basins tend to be much more restricted than what you find in the Paleozoic and Mesozoic. Paleozoic and Mesozoic, you'll find these giant blankets of, of formations of rock layers that are just stretching across huge areas. And in the Cenozoic, they're still big, but they tend to be confined to certain basins. Um, you know, you think about like the Green River Formation, where you see this ancient lake where animals were playing around and dying. Um, you know, that, that makes sense to me as a post flood situation. So I don't want to keep going on. We could go on for hours about this and, um, I don't want to, you know, steal all that time. So, um, you know, check out some of those resources. I can, I can help people find those if they want them. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Guzman. It, 
Um, I was going to say that that's a great response. And what you said, uh, Dr. McLean, is key for everybody to understand in the fact that it's it's healthy to have you know disagreements on some of the details in in regards to the world of young earth creation and and still remain brothers in Christ and and that's kind of how we advance science as we look to these different models here on this channel I personally believe in critical thinking and you know we've had different young earth creation scientists with with different models and and that's what we're here to do and that's why you guys have those conferences I imagine is to discuss the details work out the models. So I'm really glad you said that because I think that's important. And Guzman mentioned your talk at the Origins Conference, and I hope I don't I don't butcher this word. Your your talk on the pariasaurs. 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 There you go. <laughs> I'll say that ten times fast and never. Uh, I'm, I'm going to let you in a secret right now. You can pronounce it however you want. Okay. So I remember going to a, a, a conference one time and a very niche conference, like very, very, very tiny thing. And I'm like, man, I have no idea how to pronounce some of these words. And when I got there, I heard like three different pronunciations for the same word. I was like, oh, right. cool. As long as you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even something as common as Neanderthal, Neanderthalensis, I've heard it said, you know, 10 different ways. So I appreciate that. Pariasaurs. So I'll, I'll just pronounce it the way you did. And, okay. um, I remember you talked about turtle phylogeny and how there's the, there's some discrepancies there. And I think turtle phylogeny has been altered a little bit based on incoming data. Could you touch on that a little bit? Because I think that's really, really interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, so that actually goes back to our synapsid discussion too. So um, the classic way of classifying reptiles is into basically three groups to simplify it. There were synapsids, which had one hole back here diapsids, which had two, right? And then anapsid, which I didn't talk about before, have none. So um, living diapsids have two holes, would be things like lizards and birds and snakes and crocodiles and all kind of fun stuff. Uh, mammals would be your living synapsids. And turtles were thought to be living anapsids. They had no holes back there and everyone was just cool with that. That was the way it was. Well, then they started doing molecular phylogenies um, and they discovered that turtles kept nesting in a group with like the crocodiles and birds and you know closer to them than even the lizards and snakes and like that didn't make any sense because that didn't match the paleontological data and so this big debate erupted where like where do turtles fit um and so the current thinking on turtles by the majority of evolutionists is that turtles are diapsids so they had two holes so they had no holes originally then um then an ancestor reptile had two holes then turtles appeared and turtles decided I and mean, obviously personifying okay um that they're like we don't like this whole diapsid thing we're going back to anapsid okay and so they lost those holes and became secondarily anapsid uh, would be the story and so um the turtles are are interesting um from an evolutionary perspective because um they are the only vertebrate animals that have their shoulder girdle inside their rib cage um because the shell of a turtle is its rib cage um and that's really weird and so you think about how does that even evolve um, and so there's been a lot of discussion on that. And there's um, one really important fossil animal called Odontochelis, which was supposed to show some transitional states there. But even that's been called into question now because we have definite turtle tracks from earlier in the fossil record. So, um, you know, really, I think people are, are still kind of um, puzzled when it comes to turtle and how they fit in with, you know, other animals. Well, that's a great answer, uh, Dr. McLean. Yeah, I, I find that topic so interesting. Uh, Matt, I know you're, um, you are you kind of had some some input on, on that specific question on, on turtle phylogeny. Um, I don't want to hog the mic here if you had a couple comments you wanted to make. Well, I, I was talking with Arn Raw, and I brought up that, uh, you know, the turtles had two different taxonomic classifications, and he said, no, they don't. And we got into an argument over it, but it was again taxonomy, right? It doesn't really answer anything. It's just it's just a classification system. So you get in a lot of fights over something so simple as just taxonomy. I find that a lot, and uh, I'm sure you do too, as a creationist, right? <laughs> you're you ever gonna do a debate, science, right? <laughs> so yeah, are you gonna do a debate with somebody like that guy? What's that? You ever gonna do a debate with somebody like him? What if Arn Ross said, hey, let's debate? Um, I'm not a big fan of debates, honestly. Um, I just 
personally, I feel like um, when you, when you, you know, when you watch a debate, kind of the way it goes is like the people who thought this guy were going to win was going to win thought, you know, they say he won. And the people who thought this guy was going to win, they say he won. And there's people in the middle that are just like, I don't know what to make of any of it. And they feel like they don't know anything more at the end than what they do. So, <laughs> right, like, right. My personal thing is is typically like, I, I like the idea of just kind of doing presentations and, you know, people can do their rebuttals or things. But um, I also, I think it it naturally presents an opportunity where it, it, it makes it really easy to get angry with somebody or to, you know, like to say something you regret. Um, so I'm not saying like debates are wrong or anything, but just me personally, I'm just like, yeah, I think for the most part, I'll try and just stay out of that um, and not, you know, get myself in a situation where I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I do? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> right, right. Understand. Well, even, yeah, because I, like you said, these presentations followed by these types of questions that the critics would come up with anyways in terms of, of debate, I, I think this is incredibly helpful, right, to the audience, to us. And it's answering a lot of questions that that would come up in debates, anyways. Um, and uh, Dr. McLean, I, I want to respect your time. I can't believe how quickly time has flown by. We're going on an hour and fifty minutes, um, and we could probably ask you questions for the next ten hours. Um, maybe we'll start winding it down here. Okay. And um, if if Matt or Guzman, if you guys had some final words, I also want to thank the audience for so many good questions, um, so much good input and uh, Dr. McLean for, for giving us such great answers to some of these tough, tough questions. Um, I'll ask this then, because we were talking about taxonomy cl cladistics. You'll hear uh, evolution is just based on taxonomy and similarity in terms of morphology, anatomy, physiology. They'll say things like, uh, you know, humans are apes from a taxonomy standpo standpoint, or, or primates, for example but that itself doesn't declare relationship. So should we as creationists fear those labels? I'm, I'm curious as to that one. Maybe we'll wind down with that question. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And, and that's what I ran into when I was doing my um, my paper for the International Conference on Creationism on, on feathered dinosaurs. Um, you know, can you call a bird a dinosaur? What does that mean when you say a bird is a dinosaur? Right. So, um, you know, I think as with a lot of these things, what is meant in a in a kind of like public setting is different than the technical way things are used, right? Mm. So, um, you know, uh, when when an evolutionist says a bird is a dinosaur, right? They mean that two things, right? They mean that um, in their classification scheme, dinosauria is a group that contains birds inside of it, and they think that that is representing the fact that birds evolved from dinosaurs, right? So a creationist could say a bird is a dinosaur or a mammal is a cynodont. Um, if they mean it in the sense of, if you use this kind of nested hierarchy and tree thinking, that group is inside of that group because of similarities and things. But we certainly don't mean that a bird evolved from a dinosaur or a cyan you know, mammal evolved from a cynodont. Um, and so, um, some creationists then want to take that the complete opposite extreme and say, no, no, you can't say a bird is a dinosaur. You can't say, you know, a mammal is a synapsid, things like that. Um, and at that point, you're really arguing over taxonomic language and the way we choose to classify things. Um, and it gets complicated, right? Because, um, you know, for instance, like when I say, as I said in the presentation, that a bat is a mammal, I just mean that bats are in that nested hierarchy of mammals. But when an evolutionist says that, they do mean that, but they also mean that bats evolve from other types of mammals, right? So I don't say, well, because of that, I can't use the word mammal anymore, or I can't say a bat is a mammal. No, it's just that we've culturally accepted that one in our, you know, scheme as creationists. And so, um, you know, I think that's a big part of it is just that um, understanding what we're actually saying. And, you know, when I, if I go in front of a church and I say, hey, do you know, you know, birds are dinosaurs? Most people in there are going to think I'm saying birds evolve from dinosaurs, right? And they're going to be very confused. But um, in a scientific setting, I could say, you know, aves or aviale is nested within dinosauria. And I could make sense. And I know what I'm talking about. And my colleagues would know what I'm talking about. Um, but it might be confusing, you know, for the layperson. Um, and so I don't know if that answers your question or. Um, yeah. Okay. It 
it's incredibly helpful because it's something that I've I've struggled with, and and a lot of people, I think, a lot of young Earth Christians have struggled with. You know, do we, how do we approach that? And, and your answer there was extremely helpful. So then, from ev from an evolutionary standpoint, and I guess the law of monophyly in in the fact that we can never outgrow our ancestry, right? The the evolutionists would say a eukaryote will never stop being a eukaryote. A mammal will never stop yeah. being a mammal. Will just acquire new traits over time. Would, would they then say that technically we, maybe this is a silly question, but from, would they say technically we're therapsids then still? Yes. Because yeah, we are, we are therapsids. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So it, it is interesting that this whole, uh, these, these classification systematics, right. But the important right. point to take home, as you said, is it, it doesn't declare relationship. So even though we are categorized as primates or birds can be categorized as, as theropod dinosaurs. It doesn't mean we're saying birds evolved from right. theropod dinosaurs, we evolved from an ape-like ancestor. No, that, that, that was a great uh, answer. And I yeah, wanted and to make sure we got something there. Um, I think it's still, I wouldn't say it says nothing about relationship. I think it does, right? Like um, we do have more in common with, you know, monkeys than we do with trout, for instance. Like we have a lot of biological similarities, right? Um, and sometimes those groups do actually reflect common ancestry, right? If you're talking about like the horse family, for instance, where, you know, horses right. and zebras and donkeys would be would be sharing common ancestor. And so I think that's where we have to say um, they are indicating relationship, but not always descent is the, the really uh, yeah. thing. You know, like, yes, mm -hmm. um, there, there are, like, for instance, the, the word homology, right? Like Richard Owen, when he came up with that, he wasn't thinking in terms of evolution. He was just saying, hey, these traits, you know, the the hand of a human and the hand of a bat, which makes a wing, they have the same bones in them, right? Um, and they've just been modified differently. Um, but an evolutionist looks at that as automatically that's because of common descent, right? Whereas a creationist, I would say sometimes similarities are common descent, but sometimes it's relationship in a different sense because of like a blueprint, for instance. Um, so, yeah, like just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, no, that's that, that's a perfect clarification. Yes, yeah, no, I, I like that. Um, so, anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll yield here, and um, yeah, it looks like we have evidence and reason. Salvador Cordova, he's he's a blessing to this channel. He says he was at the the conference that oh. you were speaking of in in terms of the feathered dinosaurs. Um, looks like he was in the the, the physics and mitochondrial eve sessions I, I would love to be at one of those conferences that would be that would yeah, be they only happen every like five years or so um and the next yeah. one's Maryville university i think it's like 2023 maybe i want to say um but yeah you know it's a ways off yeah right, sorry right. <laughs> well like, then would have been great to meet you or <laughs> so yeah <laughs> No problem. No problem. I, I got to say, you're awesome. The presentation was amazing. It's one of those presentations where I'm definitely going to be rewatching later tonight and 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 catching all the all the little details. Um, so, anyways, we, we've we've taken a couple hours of your time. You've been an incredible blessing and extremely helpful, uh, Matt Guzman. If you guys had any final words, then we'll give uh, our guest, Dr. McLean, the final word here, and and we'll shut it down for the for the day. Great. I'll abandon mine and I'll throw in a Luca question real quick. So he can get. Ooh, incognito. Um, yes. So um, this is something that baronology, they've talked about a lot with, um, you know, Kurt Wise and Todd Wood have done a lot of writing on this. And so you can find some stuff. There's other people too I'm not thinking of at the moment. But um, essentially, you know, think back to the garden, right? Um, God told Adam to name the animals um, that he brought before him. And um, he names them, right? So he, I think he could tell them apart is the point, right? So the idea is supposed to be that there should be some kind of recognizable thing that we as humans can look at the different kinds and be able to tell them apart. So I think in principle, that makes sense. Obviously that's what we do in classification anyway, right? We, we can only use our, ourselves. Um, but on the other hand, it's like, okay, if God had brought Adam this is we're going weird hypothetical okay ready if god had brought adam a butterfly and a caterpillar separately would he have instantly known that they're in the same created kind well no i mean he would have had to watch it right you had to watch it develop and he would realize oh you know butterflies come from caterpillars but he wouldn't have known that intrinsically just by looking at a caterpillar or looking at a butterfly so i think we need to be careful 
with that, it's not always going to be immediately intuitive. There, there are going to be things that are a little bit more complicated. Awesome. Guzman. Well, that's a great. And, and Guzman, any final words? Maybe, maybe we'll make that the last question since we're going on two hours. Uh, Guzman, any final words, brother, before we, uh, no, not really. I think I'll, I think I'll ask Dr. McLean a question off air though. Um, but other than that, just want to say, um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks to Dr. McLean for coming on tonight. Thanks for having me on. And I want to thank the audience for watching. Awesome. Awesome. Great final yeah. words, gentlemen. Uh, everybody in the chat uh, loved your presentation. We have redefined living here says this has been a fantastic stream. Thank you guys. Um, it, it could not have been possible if, if it weren't for you being so generous with your time, Dr. McLean. So I appreciate it again. And please guys share this around. We need this information to get out to as many people as possible, uh, especially on this topic. People need to, to hear more about this topic. And I'm, I'm so thankful for Dr. McLean's time today. Uh, Dr. McLean, any, any final words before we shut it down for the day? Um, no, just thank you for having me and good to talk about it. Always enjoy talking about God's creation. So it's good. Amen. Amen, brother. Okay. Well, anyways, hope everybody had fun. Uh, God bless. Thank you for all the uh, input and the awesome questions from the audience. So uh, God bless. Standing for Truth is out.